So we're going to go pretty quickly talking about some interesting cases that I think are practical, not only in everyday life, but also in the month of May slash June. Okay, what's your diagnosis? Uh, what's your recommendation in this case? Here we're dealing with a posterior shoulder dislocation. You can see on this frontal radiograph, the humeral head is in internal rotation, and that gives the appearance of glenohumeral joint space widening. Note that there's this sort of subtle trough sign, which is a reverse Hill-Sachs impaction fracture. Now, if you miss this case, you're in good company. The diagnosis is missed initially half the time. Pretty amazing. Why is that? Well, they're pretty uncommon. They're only about 3% of all glenohumeral joint dislocations, uh, commonly associated with a preceding history of seizure. So what well, should we recommend if we're just given that frontal view? One view is no view, of course. You need to recommend an additional view, like an axillary view shown here that shows the posterior dislocation, or a scapular Y view posterior dislocation. Next case, here's a frontal cone down view of the shoulder and an accompanying patient with the same diagnosis. This is a case of osteonecrosis. And what we see here is a crescent sign, the curvilinear subchondral uh, lucency due to a fracture in necrotic bone. It's reminiscent of what we see in the femoral head and brings up a rather common trick at boards to show something that's a, cla a classic feature but in an unusual place. With osteonecrosis, that you're well aware of the three most common risk factors, trauma, corticosteroids, and alcoholism, as well as I'm sure you know about many more that are listed here, hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell, radiation therapy, and lupus. What I think many radiologists are less conversant with is the staging of AVN. Now, there are a lot of different staging systems, but the most common that orthopedists use is the FECOT staging system. Stage one refers to a normal X-ray and an abnormal MRI or bone scan. What we see on the MRI here is a line of demarcation between the necrotic and the viable bone. Stage two refers to some rather subtle trabecular changes, often patchy sclerosis and lucency. And if we're unsure of the finding on the radiograph, we can recommend an MRI to be sure. Stage three in the FECOT staging system refers to segmental uh, flattening or collapse, which predisposes individuals to stage four premature secondary osteoarthritis of the involved joint. The staging is important to orthopedists because it helps uh, impact treatment. For early cases, stage one and two, typically patients are treated with a core decompression, whereas stage four disease is most commonly treated with a total joint replacement. What about this unknown case? Here we're dealing with a slap lesion, a type of labral tear, in particular a superior labrum anterior to posterior tear. These tears affect the superior labrum and extend anterior and posterior to the biceps anchor, and we look for two particular diagnostic criteria to help us make the diagnosis. Of course, as with anything in radiology, it's helpful to know the normal anatomy. In particular, there can be a superior recess, normally, that runs parallel to the long axis of the biceps tendon long head as it attaches to the superior aspect of the glenoid. So here is a normal orientation of that sulcus or recess, Whereas with a slap lesion, we see high signal intensity that is exactly perpendicular to that, that is within the labrum. Of course, if we see this abnormal configuration of increased signal intensity, whether it's on an MR arthrogram or a non-arthrographic study, we can uh, suggest the diagnosis. The other diagnostic criterion that is particularly helpful to be aware of, of course, is linear high signal that extends posterior to the biceps anchor. There are a lot of variations in the anterosuperior quadrant of the labrum, but if you start seeing this high signal extending posterior to the labrum, uh, you are dealing with a labral tear. Look for a paralabral cyst as well. Next case. Here, the diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis. I personally find a systematic approach is very helpful. The ABCs, uh, the worst thing in the world is to freeze up when taking an unknown case, so you can always fall back on the ABCs alignment bone mineralization, and the cartilage or joint space when analyzing the abnormalities in an unknown. I would add to that the distribution and the presence or absence of certain types of erosions and analysis of the soft tissues, and we'll talk about how all of these can be particularly helpful as we go along. But in this case, alignment is the issue. It turns out the differential diagnosis for arthritis with subluxation includes not only RA, as was present in this case, 
but also lupus, which is a deforming non-erosive arthropathy, and as I'm sure you know, neuropathic osteoarthropathy that can also cause subluxation or dislocation in joints. Next case, number five. Do you have any recommendation for the workup of this doctor? Here we're dealing with septic arthritis. Bone mineralization is something that we can talk about in our systematic approach in this case. When it comes to bone mineralization, the differential diagnosis for an arthritis with osseous demineralization is quite long. Not just inflammatory arthropathies, but really any uh, longstanding arthritis in which there's disuse or treatment with corticosteroids, osteoporosis may be present. But whatever you do, if you have a monoarthritis that's rapidly progressive and, and symptomatic, you need to consider septic arthritis that may be complicated in turn by osteomyelitis. If you suspect septic arthritis, you know, of course, that pyogenic or bacterial infections of joints can cause rapid joint destruction. The most common organism is Staph aureus. And my father and brother who are orthopedists are fond of saying, do not let the sun set on suspected pyarthrosis if you even discuss that in your differential, uh, consider aspirating the joint before it's too late. Okay, number six. And here's another patient with uh, the same diagnosis. You of course know this one after Lynn's talk. We're dealing here with psoriatic arthritis. Again, systematic approach, alignment, uh, B, bone mineralization. Here, we don't have osteoporosis. And it turns out that when we have an abnormal joint with arthritis, but no osteoporosis, the differential diagnosis is relatively short. Seronegatives like psoriatic arthritis that we have in this particular case, we're going to need to consider. Uh, gout, synovial osteochondromatosis, and PVNS also uh, belong on that list. Psoriatic arthritis, by way of review, affects the hands and feet quite commonly at the IP joints causing certain characteristic deformities, the so-called pencil and cup deformity, and telescoping deformity. Uh, reactive sclerosis, the so-called ivory phalanx, may be seen, and diffuse soft tissue swelling in the involved digit, the so-called sausage digit, is also considered characteristic of psoriatic arthritis. In the axial skeleton, the SI joints, of course, may be affected. In the acute setting with active sacroiliitis, we see erosion, sometimes with marginal sclerosis, often asymmetrically involving the iliac side of the SI joint. In the spine, we look for bulky paravertebral ossification, again, typically an asymmetric process side to side. In contradistinction to this type of abnormality, which is symmetric. Ankylosing spondylitis. Here, the differential diagnosis of arthritis with bone production is, is something that we need to keep in mind. Namely, the seronegatives. Ankylosing spondylitis is the most common of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. IBD can look like it. We've talked about psoriatic, and I know you've heard about riders, and that it's properly nowadays termed reactive arthritis. With ankylosing spondylitis in the axial skeleton, we typically see symmetric involvement. At the SI joints, sacroiliitis can progress to ankylosis, like we see here. In the spine, we look for these delicate, symmetric syndesmophytes, areas of ossification in the annulus fibrosis, causing uh, often ankylosis. What's in the differential diagnosis of AS? Well, IBD arthritis can look very similar, but it's less severe and, and considerably less common. We've also talked about psoriatic and reactive arthritis. Um, they look a little bit different. In the spine, it's the bulky asymmetric spurs rather than the delicate symmetric syndesmophytes. And typically, those conditions affect the extremities at the small distal joints, like the IP joints, for example, rather than ankylosing spondylitis that typically involves the large central joints, the hip and the shoulder. Speaking of the shoulder, synovial osteochondromatosis. In our systematic approach here, we note the cartilage or joint space in our analysis. It turns out that with most arthritides, uh, the joint space ends up being narrowed. But when there's preservation of the joint space, we have a short list of contenders to think about right off the bat. Synovial osteochondromatosis was present in this case. When we say that, we should also be thinking about uh, PVNS as having many similar findings. TB with femistors triad of slow narrowing of the joint space, juxtaarticular osteoporosis and marginal erosions also is classically uh, uh, put on that list.
With synovial osteochondromatosis, there's metaplasia of the synovium that results in cartilage nodules in the joint. About two-thirds of the time, they calcify or ossify, so we can see them easily on uh, X-ray or CT. But about a third of the time, uh, they're non-mineralized. This is the way they look when they're ossified. But when they're not ossified, we can't really see them very easily uh, on conventional radiography. Here, an arthrogram is being performed, contrast is being instilled into the joint, and you start to see that there are some filling defects uh, in the contrast column. An MR was then done, and here you can see these non-mineralized cartilage nodules within the joint with the associated uh, classic eccentric erosion of the femoral neck and head, synovial chondromatosis. Next unknown, this is a case of hemochromatosis, although the differential diagnosis that is certainly very acceptable, uh, CPPD. And here, I uh, use this case as an excuse to talk about distribution being an important thing to analyze when looking at arthritis cases. Here, we're looking at a particular target site, the MCP joints. And what we see is an arthritis with associated hook-like osteophytes. Now, rheumatoid arthritis also affects this ar these articulations, but tends not to cause bone production. It causes erosions, but not generally osteophytes like we see here. So this is characteristic, these hook-like osteophytes of hemochromatosis and CPPD. Two patients with the same diagnosis, gout. Erosions are very helpful to consider in your systematic approach to taking an unknown case. I know that uh, gout is something that you're very familiar with after uh, sitting through this course, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, I will simply say that it's most common in the lower extremity, particularly involving small joints. Some people think that has to do with uh, the lower temperature uh, in small joints of the distal extremity. I find that interesting. Um, characteristic sites uh, of erosion are at the MTP joints. We look for these erosions with overhanging edges, uh, often with a sclerotic margin and an adjacent soft tissue mass due to the presence of a gouty tophus causing the erosion. Given the degree of articular involvement in soft tissue mass, there is relatively little in the way of osteoporosis in the adjacent bones. Let's take a look at soft tissues. In gout, of course, we look for eccentric or lobulated uh, soft tissue prominence from gouty tophi, like we see here on an MRI associated with a small eccentric erosion. Sometimes these gouty tophi can be quite prominent and cause erosions at other sites, here uh, at the olecranon, here another one around the elbow. Sometimes these can go on to uh, calcify, and uh, uh, this is another characteristic appearance for prominent gouty uh, tophi. Here another type of calcification, this one affecting the acral regions. There's some soft tissue loss distally as well, scleroderma. Now, this brings up the topic of soft tissue calcifications and how this can have a salutary effect on limiting uh, a differential diagnosis or making a specific diagnosis. When we look at the soft tissues, we can look at some imaging findings, and this can help us with uh, narrowing the diagnosis. So if we see fusiform soft tissue swelling around a joint, that's characteristic of many inflammatory arthropathies like RA. Diffuse soft tissue swelling, involving an entire digit, sausage digit, characteristic of psoriatic and reactive uh, types of arthropathy. Eccentric soft tissue swelling, as we mentioned, uh, characteristic of a gouty tophus or amyloid, but it's those calcifications that are particularly uh, characteristic of connective tissue diseases, like in the case we're looking at now. Now, connective tissue diseases include scleroderma as well as lupus and dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Connective tissue diseases in general are uh, categorized as chronic multisystem autoimmune diseases with an increased propensity for a positive ANA, most commonly in young to middle-aged women is when they present. And in all of these conditions, there's some variable propensity to acroosteolysis, soft tissue calcification, and skin abnormalities. So again, just to drive the point home with scleroderma, we see acral or distal bone and soft tissue resorption, that is acro osteolysis. Note also the characteristic dystrophic appearing calcification. Next case. A little bit of a tough case, sarcoidosis. But many bone radiologists sort of like this uh, because it's a rather distinctive appearance that we see. 
a lace-like trabecular pattern without expansion of the bone like we would see, say, with, with pagets. Fusiform soft tissue swelling may be seen, as well as patchy areas of sclerosis in sarcoidosis. Considered an idiopathic sy uh, systemic granulomatous disease, bone involvement occurs only in a minority of cases, up to 15%. And when it is present in bone, lung disease is present too, often in the form of hyaluradenopathy or pulmonary fibrosis. This is uh, a favorite of my mentor, Don Resnick, called OPLL. Now, OPLL, or ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, is an idiopathic disease most commonly seen in older men affecting the cervical spine in more than 95% of cases. And although it may be asymptomatic, uh, it may also cause myelopathy when there's enough of it to uh, contribute to central canal stenosis. Of course, when we see OPLL, we need to look for DISH, and when we see DISH, we need to look for OPLL. What's DISH? DISH is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Idiopathic bone production is seen typically in men, uh, and there are three diagnostic criteria that are uh, officially out there for the diagnosis of DISH. The first is that of flowing ossification over four contiguous levels anteriorly. And when you ask Dr. Resnick about why four, why not three, why not five, there must have been some heavy statistics going into that determination, right? He says, well, there were four of us in the room, and we each got a level. So that's, that's, uh, that's the story, anyway, of how, uh, why it's four contiguous levels, not three, not five. The second diagnostic criterion is that the disc height is normal. This helps differentiate this marginal uh, paravertebral ossification that uh, is seen in DISH from that seen with develop, uh, degenerative disc disease. And finally, uh, it's nice to know that the SI joints are normal because, of course, seronegative spondyloarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis uh, can also cause ossification in the paravertebral uh, region. Next case, because I'm such a nice guy, I'm going to show you an old film or image on the same patient when he was just a seven-year-old boy. The diagnosis here, neurofibromatosis. Now, neurofibromatosis is considered a mesodermal dysplasia involving bone in more than 80% of all cases. When it affects the tibia, there is often early on bowing. There may subsequently be a pathologic fracture that doesn't heal, resulting in pseudarthrosis that's considered characteristic. Some of the findings that might be seen in the spine include posterior scalloping. In the differential diagnosis for posterior scalloping of vertebral bodies, I would consider mesodermal, other mesodermal dysplasias, as well as dural ectasia and a mass lesion uh, causing this. Of course, a neurofibroma here, uh, extending out into the paravertebral soft tissue on a coronal T1. Neurofibromatosis can also cause anterior vertebral body scalloping, just like other mesodermal dysplasias, and as we will see shortly, lymphadenopathy, aortic aneurysm, and TB. So here, an aortic aneurysm associated with vertebral body scalloping. So that's in the differential. Tuberculosis, you've seen examples of that earlier today, but it can also uh, cause erosions of the vertebral body. Here we're going to move on and talk about uh, this peculiar condition that uh, many musculoskeletal radiologists like. You'll see that there is a cleft of uh, lucency within the flattened bone. It's not stippled like a gas-forming infection, but rather this is an intravertebral vacuum cleft, reminiscent of the crescent sign that we've already discussed with AVN uh, at other sites like the femoral and humeral heads. With this intravertebral vacuum cleft, uh, it's typically considered either a sign of uh, osteonecrosis, like might be seen in a patient with steroids, or it may be seen in the setting of delayed post-traumatic collapse, which has been termed uh, Kummel's disease. But the importance of it is that when you see it, it makes infection or malignancy unlikely, because those two conditions are associated with positive pressure. And if you take this patient and put them into extension, the vacuum cleft becomes more prominent. And there's no, it's not a stippled um, lucency like with a gas-forming infection. What about vertebra plana? 
or compression fractures. We've seen it with eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, we've seen it with osteoporosis. Uh, here, a patient who was on steroids. The differential diagnosis for vertebral plana also should include tumor. Myeloma was present in this case, and obviously uh, trauma can also cause compression fractures. Next unknown case, Gaucher's disease. Now, Gaucher's disease is caused by marrow infiltration and can cause the Erlenmeyer flask deformity like we see here, as well as osteonecrosis or AVN in the femoral head, as was present in this case. It is a lipid storage disease that may be familial, and although the severity varies, uh, most patients can have a normal lifespan. Next unknown case, a stress fracture, certainly common in clinical practice. Uh, for example, uh, here we see a runner with a fatigue type of stress fracture in which abnormal stress was exerted on normal bone, classically seen in athletes, whereas the insufficiency type of stress fracture, as you know, is uh, something that occurs in when there's normal stress on abnormally weakened bone, uh, for example, in a patient with osteoporosis. In both cases, we're dealing with repetitive loading of the bone and failure of that bone at characteristic sites. One characteristic site for the fatigue type of stress fracture in a runner, of course, the tibial mid-shaft stress fracture. What about this case? You know this one, of course. The diagnosis is an insufficiency fracture. But what I will tell you is it blows examiners away in Louisville how many people recommend putting a needle in this. And they don't like hearing that. Uh, so I would uh, recommend uh, another course of action, perhaps uh, following this up. But I would not recommend uh, uh, biopsying this straight away. It's a very characteristic uh, diagnosis with diagnostic imaging features. Two patients with the same diagnosis. This is Paget's disease. Paget's disease, also referred to as osteitis deformans, is a chronic skeletal disease characterized by disordered bone remodeling. And although the cause is unknown, it's probably due to some, uh, probably due to a paramyxovirus in patients with some uh, genetic susceptibility. There are three phases to know about, the lytic or osteoclastic phase, where there's well-defined osteolysis with non-sclerotic margins that can march down the bone about a centimeter a year, causing this flame-shaped or blade of grass uh, appearance. A second phase, the mixed phase, is characterized by trabecular coarsening, osseous expansion, and cortical thickening. These are three diagnostic criteria of Paget's disease that should be committed to memory. They are extremely uh, helpful. The third phase, the sclerotic or osteoblastic phase, can result in this appearance, the ivory vertebral body for which there is a differential that includes an osteoblastic meta metastasis and lymphoma. There are some buzzwords that may be used to describe Paget's disease, including the picture fame vertebral body. Osteoporosis circumscripta is the well-defined osteolysis that occurs in the calvarium. The calvarium may also be affected in the sclerotic phase with this cotton wool appearance. And here, uh, a related case, number 21, a difficult diagnosis. This is Paget's disease with a secondary sarcoma. It turns out that Paget's disease has some complications that we need to look for whenever we make the diagnosis. Paget's disease may look dense in many cases, but the bone is weakened, and that can result in bowing, uh, accompanying the osseous expansion and cortical thickening. With weakening of the bone and bowing, there can be insufficiency stress fractures, typically at the convex aspect of the bone, like we see here. And although they often only go partway through the bone, they may extend all the way through the bone. So look for fractures with Paget's disease. Neurologic compromise is another important potential complication. Spinal stenosis may occur because of either the osseous expansion from Paget's or, in this case, there was a pathologic fracture with retropulsion resulting in spinal stenosis. But the most dreaded complication is sarcomatous transformation, in this case, into an osteosarcoma. You can see marrow replacement, cortical breakthrough, and an adjacent soft tissue mass. Next case, moving on to case 24. In this case, we're dealing with hemophilia. Of course, you know it's a bleeding disorder that may result in chronic recurrent hemarthroses with a subsequent arthropathy 
namely uh, it causes widening of the intercondylar notch that we see here, as well as squaring of the patella. Hemosiderin on MRI, of course, can cause low signal intensity on all pulse sequences with blooming uh, after, uh, with, with blooming on gradient echo images. The differential diagnosis for hemosiderin in the joint not only includes hemophilia, but also old trauma and PVNS. And we started just a couple minutes late, so uh, I'm just going to finish up with a, a couple uh, last cases before we move on to the main event. Uh, here, one more unknown, number 25. PVNS. This is a condition in which there's prolifer uh, proliferation of the synovium, again associated with hemarthrosis and hemosiderin in the joint. Now, of course, both PVNS and idiopathic synovial osteochondromatosis are conditions in which the bone density uh, is commonly normal, in which the joint space is generally preserved, although there may be marginal erosions like we see posteriorly here. And we often see what looks like an intra-articular mass uh, that here looks like a dense effusion in the suprapatellar region. Both PVNS and idiopathic synovial osteochondromatosis can cause pain and mechanical symptoms. It's typically a monoarticular process, most commonly affecting the knee, followed by the hip and the elbow. On MR, we look for an intra-articular mass, low in signal intensity, blooming on gradient echo images. Uh, here is the helpful uh, film for you to make the diagnosis definitively of hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, a perennial favorite in the city limits of Louisville. Now, perios diffuse periostitis, of course, can be caused by many uh, different conditions, chronic venous stasis in the lower extremities, cafes disease in young kids, thyroid acropachy we've seen in the phalanges of the hand of patients who've been treated for hyperparathyroidism. But this is a case of hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. Note the tram track appearance, both on uh, bone scan and on the radiograph. Of course, in rare cases, this can be familial or idiopathic, but most commonly, it's secondary to some other disease, usually pulmonary, pleural, or cardiac. Uh, abdominal uh, causes can also be found.